as a very young girl, I was wandering through Europe in 1979, and I was very homesick. And it came the 26th of April, and I decided to go to Gallipoli to see if I could meet some Australians. And do you know how many people were there at that graveyard in 1979? One. Just me. So in terms of get over it, I think we've got back into it again. And the other thing is, the more that we talk about Gallipoli and the Anzacs, the less we talk about what's actually happening now. Warfare today is becoming more and more secretive. This is the discourse, it's about the Anzacs. And it's not about the frontier wars either. Well, last year, we went to the Canberra Peace Convergence and David Bradbury has made a feature-length documentary about that. Scott Ludlam was there as well. It is fantastic. The last 10 minutes of it, roughly, is uh, it's very exciting, but the last 10 minutes will leave you in tears because it's about the Aboriginal people trying to go up to the Remembrance Shrine and the police blocking them. The reason we're doing this is to try and They're not getting through this year either. Frontier war. That's right. Is that what your ancestors died for? Don't touch hey. No. Do not touch me. Do not, do not touch me. Come on. 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 No. Hey, don't touch me. Don't touch me. Don't touch me. Let him go. Let him go. National Service was reintroduced in Australia, there's a potential for maybe young men and possibly young women as well being involved in US wars of aggression. Do you think that might bolster an opposition to the American uh, the US alliance within the Australian population? I know, for instance, that a lot of people who would are quite happy to see our uh, young men being sent off to these unwinnable wars of aggression, but when it comes to their own children, they would be far more, less bellicose. We've refined the technique of paying the dues to the Americans with as little impact on us as possible. And you can, and, and people write this, people who write about the similar issues in the United States make this point as well. People will, will walk up to you in the United States if you're a soldier and thank you for your service, but they'll object to, to um, more taxes going into, into military things, and I think that's happening here, I agree with, with Noah about military expenditure, but but I think people are, are, are getting quite like the idea that we have a military, um, but as long as it doesn't involve me, doesn't involve my kids. Um, the United States, in the last few decades, has relied on poor white kids and poor black kids, poor white kids from the south and poor black kids, to be the kind of grunt fodder or cannon fodder. There's evidence that that's happening a bit in Australia now with Indigenous kids. Very interesting to see it happen. Um, targeting, recruitment targeting of Indigenous kids. That there aren't as many proportionately as there are in the United States, but there is quite a lot of that sort of thing happening. Because so I think, to answer the question, I wouldn't introduce national service for the sake of getting opposition, but I think it, you're right that 
the military burden is being borne by fewer and fewer people and there's something intrinsically wrong with that. For a long time, back to the 1780s, there's been a theory that uh, liberal democracies do not go to war because of the cost that the common person pays. Uh, but since then, uh, liberal democracies have been involved in many wars um, and, uh, and increasingly, I think, we're seeing that as casualty figures are able to be contained as a result of uh, the high-tech nature of war, it becomes even more likely that uh, the casualties that will be suffered will be on the other side, not necessarily on ours. I mean, I've just been reading about uh, the plans of the Australian government to buy uh, drone uh, weaponry to protect our borders from, from these vile people trying to come by boat. Um, and that the military is looking at ways that it can use drone warfare, warfare or technology in, a, in, in the future. So, you know, rather than having people on the battlefield, we'll more or less, more likely have people sitting in um, Canberra or wherever uh, playing war games. And, and you know, that, that's probably not going to have the same level of opposition as uh, the sort of war that we've been accustomed to and the casualties of war of recent recent times. My comment to the first uh, speaker is uh, I went to the 14th Anzac Labor History Conference in Melbourne in February and presented a paper on Dennis Kevins's poetry. And his poetry is exclusively banned from the Australian War Memorial because he did the slouch of Vietnam and uh, a hundred poems on Gallipoli in World War One, where his uncles and grandfather fought. Um, and that's up on the Spirit of Eureka website if you want to read it to anyone. Um, now, out of that conference, they had a 12-page brochure, uh, a counter-ANZAC uh, publication, plus the papers from the, uh, the I noticed, MAPW uh, conference for high school teaching on uh, alternative ANZAC theories um, uh, and ideas. Now, they've got this ANZAC Day event coming up. At Centennial Park, which probably ten or twenty thousand fathers and mums will take their kids along to and camp out on Anzac Eve. I raised this earlier in the year um, when we had our discussion on um, U.S. military lines here. What way can we protest against that without appearing to be hostile to those who are there to celebrate their relatives and so on and so forth? Um, given the fact that the only peace uh, protests we have in Australia at the moment are things like uh, knee-jerk reactions to individual events overseas with little pickets at the town hall. Is there any creative way we can infiltrate that event and get on to the 10,000 kids that could be brainwashed and have the dawn service screen to them in Centennial Park? My statement question to the second speaker briefly is that you don't have to go past Macquarie University to see the think tanks at work with the Vice-Chancellor of Webb. I was involved in student occupation there where 300 got arrested in 1974 because of the CIA connections and Russell, Russell, Roger Russell at uh, Chemical and Biological Warfare, Vice-Chancellor at Flinders at the same time. There was many occupations of universities. Sydney University, US Study Centre, who have had many speakers here, funded by Rayathon, one of the uh, major missile constructors. Now, my, uh, well, question to you is, relates to the same thing. How can we creatively demonstrate against militarisation, given the fact that the Australian military has been totally integrated, you only got to read some of the stuff from Hannah and Dennis, totally integrated into the US war machine, and we're just there as a, a more, uh, you know, a junior partner as such, and all of our arms purchases and whatever are now streamlined to be compatible with the US Army. Jefferson, I was at the conference too. I remember you asking long-winded questions down there too, but there's always something in them. Um, Camp Gallipoli, the thing I thought was at Randwick, um, but maybe it's at Centennial Park, we know a bit about that. The one in Auckland's been cancelled. The Kiwis have got more sense than we have, I think. Um, and they're quite happy that they've cancelled it. It's not going as well as it's as they hoped. Um, they brought the prices down to their ceremonial their souvenir swags and whatever. Frankly, I just think keep out of the way. Um, let them have their fun, last longer. I don't think there's any point going along to that sort of thing 
just it'll get it'll get page three coverage in the paper. It'll get Channel Nine News will emote over it, and then it'll be forgotten in two days. Keep up the struggle for three and four years, and by the time of the centenary of the, of the Treaty of Versailles in 2019, people will have forgotten about Camp Gallipoli, but they might well have remembered the sort of things that people have done over a long time to wear down Anzacary. But there's no point um, getting in front of kids and stopping them having fun on Anzac Day, really. Add a description next year, should we do something about that instead for the centenary? Oh. I mean, look, it's an excellent question. It's a, it's a question that really asks deep uh, uh, reflection on our university sector more broadly where the funding comes from uh, and how universities have been restructured to in, in integrate with corporate interests. I mean, it's a big question. I don't really have an answer for it, but it's something that we need to be aware of. And certainly I've been saying for some time now that university education and the university sector needs to reflect on its purpose and its aims because it has largely fallen into the, I, I think, in, to the, the structure, the, the sort of structure of reproducing or producing students for um, for the for economic value and not for the intrinsic value of education and knowledge. And they're big questions that I can't really answer, but certainly important ones. How do you feel about the Anzac myth and how it um, creates an ideology of heroic self-sacrifice, whether it's for the military or even within the workplace? and also notions of a common national interest, a, a one nation ideology, which uh, elides the real divisions within Australian society between rich and poor, labour and capital. And I was, while you were talking, I was thinking of the late great historian, Eric Hobsbawm, and his, his study on the invention of traditions, uh, con the construction of artificial myths yeah. to serve the, the elites, and how progressive historians have to create counter-narratives, alternative histories, such as perhaps celebrating the Anti-Conscription League, for instance, as a way of combating these ruling myths that um, serve the interests of the elites. The, the only thing I'd be wary of is constructing a single alternative myth. I mean, countries, nations that have kind of um, gone for a single myth, a founding myth, have kind of come to sticky ends. I mean, think about Romulus and Remus and the, the Roman Republic and um, on Volk, on Reich, on Führer. Um, they didn't go too well. Um, the light of the, the, the city on the hill, the US, um, another single myth. You know, get as many myths as, get as many stories, not myths, as we can. I mean, we say on our website, when we first started, someone said we should have a slogan, we should say Anzac, get over it. And I thought, I've been a lobbyist. You don't get rid of half your market straight away. So we've consciously said, not only Anzac, but also Anzac is important, not so much, and we get a twist on this, not so much because of what guys in Kharkiv did in war, but because of what war did to us, did to our country. So it's important. But so many other things are important as well. And if you plug for the website, if you look on that website, you'll see there's about half of it. It's about war kind of stuff. And it, analyzes Anzac in a way that Brendan Nelson would think was anti-patriot and unpatriotic. But there's lots of other stuff on there as well. There's, there's probably a book about bushwalking that guy was handing out. Because those things are just as much part of being Australian than what happened in Turkey a hundred years ago. I, mean, I think it's a great, again, another great question. I mean, absolutely nationalism serves that, that purpose. And I mean, going right back to Marx and Hobbesborn being a Marxist, historian certainly builds on that notion that nationalism is part of the bourgeois uh, and, and very much part of a capitalist construction of you know sort of, you know, sort of shared identity um, as, a, as a way of masking uh, deep divisions uh, and I guess one one I don't think we should forget Anzac like David I think it's about what we remember about it that's important and you know the fact that it was an imperial invasion of a, of a country that we that we were part of a war that was a result of uh, a rivalry between imperial powers over how they would divide up all those parts of Anzac are really important to remember as well as the horror and anyone who's read and I you know I've, I've read some of the 
um, diaries of those uh, Australian soldiers who fought over there will know that it was not heroic and romantic at all. It was horrific and traumatising and it's remembering those aspects of Anzac which I think are really important for our national you know, identity, whatever that is, rather than the sort of, the, the sort of um, story we've been sold. And of course the other aspect of the story that's really important to remember about Anzac is how Australian soldiers were sold that campaign. You know, there's this great passage, I think it's from the Clive Bean book on... Charles Bean. Charles Bean, sorry, book on Anzacs, where in one of the uh, diaries or one of the reflections that he calls on, a soldier talks about how he was told that he was going overseas to fight some black fellas and that, you know, they would have spears and all he would have to do is turn up and they would turn around and run off and that it would just be like sport. Now, it's those aspects of how war was racialized and the other was demonized that we need to remember as well because that, unfortunately, is becoming part of our national psyche today. I think the gentleman who answered the question might have implied... Um, Anzac gets tacked, and I think someone earlier on talked about Anzac and sport. Um, it gets tacked onto all sorts of inappropriate things. I mean, Anzac and sport, um, Anzac spirit and emergency services, emergency services people. I would have hoped that if I was ever relying on an emergency services person, that their uh, professionalism, training and community spirit would be enough for them to do whatever they needed to do to help save my house or whatever. And they didn't need bullshit about Anzac laid over the top. And a lot of them would say it was bullshit too. My name is Gwyn, I'm on the committee. My question I think is mainly for you, David, but of course your thoughts know would be welcome. I'm thinking about where are the resources to counter this militarism, particularly of our youth. And what immediately occurred to me, of course, is the role of the mainstream churches, particularly the Catholic Church, but also the Anglican. Now, in all the great movements against the various wars we've been involved in since the Second World War, there has been enormous support from the church I know about, particularly is the Catholic, for in the great peace marches on the peace uh, organising committee. I think these two churches are actually um, very much would be with you what you've been saying tonight. The quote that you, David, gave from Michael McGurr is part of that. Michael McGurr is a leading Catholic intellectual. So, and the churches have many, many church schools. It seems to me that there's a resource there by the very nature of their faith, by the very nature of their own tradition, starting actually with Cardinal Maddox back in the in First World War I, which is part of the, the myth, if you like, the story of the Catholic Church who opposed the conscription of uh, that war. Um, I'm just wondering, are you thinking at all about linking up? It's very easy to do with some of the key peace activists that are in both churches and bring this material to them and see what they can do with their, their schools in particular to have people like you coming to their schools. Their schools are very open to good speakers to come on the issues of the day. But it just seems to me that that's an enormous resource whether you're a believer or not is unimportant, completely unimportant. It's an enormous resource to actually counter what you've been so brilliantly putting to us tonight. The payoff with getting a good relationship with religious denominations now is a lot less than it would have been 100 years ago because a lot less people are involved with But leaving that aside, um, we certainly have got links with peace groups, there's one in there's one in Melbourne which has a strong religious um, element to it. Um, there are church people involved in MAPW, which is we we work quite closely with. We've got an MAPW person on our um, on our committee, uh, and there are, as I said, religious people in that. Um, as far as schools go, we. We did a thing with um, Doug Newton, who's speaking at one of the things that Joe was advertising. We did a thing at St Scholastica's in February, uh, which also included uh, those year 12 kids. 
also included um, people from Riverview, Tony Abbott's old school. We're doing Pimble Girls School later in the year. Is it, Pim is it school at Pimble, I think? So, that's the one. The trouble is that the people that do these extracurricular things tend to be of, of what perhaps one might call the officer class. It would be really great to get into um, public schools. I have to remember public in New South Wales is different from public in Victoria where I come from. But anyway, getting into government schools, you're not going to kill off and Zachary in four years, but you're going to get more and more people saying, what is this nonsense? When the, the, the Kiwis were bragging earlier this week about the um, cancellation of the Camp Gallipoli thing at Ellsley Racecourse in Auckland, one guy over there blogged and said, look, I reckon there's about one third Anzac, as he didn't use that term, that was what he meant, one third people who don't care in Australia, that would be particularly people who are of non-Anglo-Celtic background. And one third who do care, who think it's all pretty stupid, but they are so afraid of being jumped on by Anzacers and told, you know, piss off you pinko commie bastard, which is what people tend to, have tended to have said to them when they've opposed Anzacery in the past, that they keep their heads down. And I say to people, don't keep your heads down. Keep, you know, doing silly things like writing to the paper and having demos if it's appropriate and, and make people realise that it isn't the only way of being an Australian and Zachary. I am uh, a veteran of World War II and a peace activist from a way back. Uh, now, well, uh, much was made about the legend of uh, Simpson, the man on the donkey in World War I in particular. Now, I wonder if we know more about, enough about Simpson to realise that how completely opposite his case was to the kind of myth that was perpetrated by the authorities. He was not a, a militarist. He was an internationalist. He was he hurt he helped the Turkish wounded, as well as the Anzac wounded. He was the son of a Chilean miner from North East England. Came to Australia as an immigrant. Was unemployed in 1914 and joined up, like so many people who joined up. And, uh, well, do we know enough about that? Simpson has long ago become a myth. Um, People tried to get him a Victoria Cross a little while ago. Um, I don't think there's much point saying more about Simpson. P people know that he was um, a radical. He was a bit of a bit of a lad. He wanted to go to England to um, see his mum. He thought he was going to Egypt. And he was going to get from Egypt to England. Gallipoli was a bit of a shock to him. Um, he was a very bra brave man doing what he did. There were lots of other people. Um, like Simpson. Um, as I said, Simpson, like Alec Campbell, who was a, a radical and a union, a union um, bother boy and all sorts of things, but was sanctified after his death as the last Anzac. I, I really don't think there's much point in trying to am amend the myths that apply to individuals. I think, I think we need to pull out um, stories about individuals that, that um, that haven't been publicised. I think Simpson's a lost cause, frankly. Um, you're not going to change much on that. Um, but yeah, there, there are others. There are other stories that need to be promoted which haven't had a currency so far. Would you please show your appreciation for our two wonderful speakers?